Welcome to this uh, third seminar on the European Green Deal, where we will discuss in greater detail three prioritized sectors and opportunities for cooperation. Uh, the EU is aiming to transform Europe into the first uh, uh, first uh, climate neutral continent and with the European Green Deal um, uh, one aims to transform the EU into a modern and resource efficient economy with net zero emissions by 2050. My name is Kjetil Elsebutangen and I'm moderating this uh, series of in total five seminars where we tr try to provide you with information raise awareness, uh, give you an update on recent developments uh, within uh, Norwegian research uh, and also build competence on the European Green Deal. Um, and certainly also trying to uh, uh, reflect and showcase some concrete projects and opportunities for cooperation. Today we will focus on carbon capture and storage, CCS and renewable energy. Uh, this includes offshore wind and solar energy. And the aim is also to explore opportunities for the private sector uh, as well as for the embassies. We have assembled a panel of uh, highly competent speakers today uh, that will shed light on these uh, topics for you. And you are also welcome to raise your hands uh, uh, and ask questions towards the end of the seminar. And also please do not hesitate to put your questions in the chat if you would like to, uh, and then also to engage uh, in the chat uh, to, to connect with each other and, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, prepare the ground for better cooperation. Today's seminar is split in two uh, parts. The first part is open to everyone and provides an update on recent developments in CCS, offshore wind and solar energy. The second part it will be organized as a matchmaking event where we divide the participants into parallel meetings for each of these three sectors. The second part is uh, open to selected companies and embassies. Our first speaker today is Mr. Ragnar Semunset, Councillor for Energy at the Mission of Norway uh, to the EU. He has close to 10 years uh, of experience from the Norwegian Ministry of Petroleum and Energy and is an expert on energy policy and the energy market in the European Union and the European Economic Area. He will provide an update on the Longship, the Norwegian project on carbon capture, transport and storage, as well as to introduce to us, uh, us to the main focus areas of the EU when it comes to CCS. Ragnar will be followed by Mr. Erik Marstein, who is an expert on solar energy. He is currently the head of research on solar power systems at the Institute for Energy and Technology. Erik will be followed by Ms. Eli Värum Rognerud, the head of the program for high potential opportunities at Innovation Norway. She will introduce us to Innovation Norway's program for major export initiatives, uh, as well as to specific projects in offshore wind. After Eli's uh, presentation, we will hear from Mr. Christoph Pink, who is the manager of, uh, for international relations at the AIDE cluster. The AIDE cluster is located uh, in Arndal and is uh, the Norwegian Center of Expertise for Sustainable Process Industry. They help businesses uh, ensure competitiveness in a world that requires sustainability. So without further ado, I will now invite Mr. Ragnar Semunset to take the floor or the camera and the microphone. Uh, Ragnar, please, you join us from Brussels today. Yes, uh, and uh, thank you very much for um, the kind uh, introduction, uh, Zetel. So I've... Um, um, prepared a small um, presentation or I should uh, or, or this time I have avoided slides so um, I'll try to do this um, still try to do it as uh, organized as possible um, 
my main message is uh, really that uh, working on CCS in Brussels these days, it's uh, it's uh, it's a lot of interesting developments uh, happening, and it's very interesting to see uh, how the Norwegian policy on CCS is um, influencing uh, discussions and developments in Brussels. So that's that's my main topic for uh, for today, really. And I would say that, I mean, if we uh, disregard the COVID for a moment, uh, I would say that the last year was a quite good one, at least when we are discussing um, carbon capture and storage, CCS. Um, I mean, uh, in Norway, the full scale CCS project, the longship project is being realized. And this has in turn given a push for CCS in Europe more generally, at least that's my clear impression. So, um, in Brussels last year, we witnessed uh, renewed interest in both CCS and CCU, meaning both storage and also the use of CO2. Um, the Commission is uh, generally using the term CCUS to cover both aspects. But of course, from a Norwegian perspective, we are particularly focusing on the storage part, as uh, of course, storage is a key part of Norwegian longship project and also the storage part is, of course, necessary for carbon capture to be an efficient climate tool. Um, a clear example of the uh, increasingly active role of the European Commission was the launch of the EU's CCUS Forum, which took place in mid-October. Um, during this event, we saw both Vice President Franz Timmermans and Energy Commissioner Carl de Simpson holding keynote speeches where they clearly stated the need for CCUS and also that this is the moment to develop it. Um, and to give a summary of their analysis, so to speak, um, they started out by pointing, uh, by underlining that the EU now has a climate law in place making climate neutrality in 2050 a legally binding target, as well as a 55% reduction target by 2030. And to reach these targets, all tools in the toolbox are needed. Um, and CCUS is particularly then a necessary tool for hard to abate sectors, such as the steel and cement industry, for instance. Um, then we have the question of hydrogen to decarbonize Europe's uh, industry and the energy sector, hydrogen uh, will be playing an important role. And to scale up the hydrogen market, blue hydrogen is needed, and here CCS technology is a prerequisite. Um, in addition, um, the Commissioner and the Vice President pointed out that from their point of view, the legal and financial framework is now uh, to a large extent in place from the EU side. Uh, the Innovation Fund is a key example, which we will be uh, discussing uh, later on as well. And a well-functioning emission trading system with high ETS prices. That, is, of course, also helps um, developing uh, a concrete project. And that is, uh, was also a key message from their side, that now we see a number of activities in a number of member states. Um, we see several businesses working on concrete projects. So, if you, for instance, have a look at um, uh, an interactive CCS map, which is made by an NGO called the Clean Air Task Force, you get an impression of all the different projects being developed these days. And it's promising to see that the map of Europe is now being filled with color in a number of, of member states. And this is, this is really important because a major problem with CCS in Europe is that there has been much talk and little action. Um, in this respect, I would say that the uh, role of the Innovation Fund is, is crucial for these first projects to being uh, uh, launched. Um, the aim of the fund is exactly to bring breakthrough technologies to the market and, and kickstart early projects. And in November, we saw the result from the first call for large scale projects. Um, here we uh, saw that um, more than 1 billion euros were allocated to seven projects. So more than 1 billion euros to seven projects, seven large projects. And of these seven, four of them had a CCS component. Um, and all these uh, four projects, which were looking at CCS as part of their solution, were all considering storage of CO2 in Norway. And uh, at least in my view, we can hardly find better proof that the Norwegian longship project, project is actually paving the way for subsequent CCS projects elsewhere in Europe. Um, 
I guess many of you are quite familiar with the Norwegian Longship project, but let me in any case give you a small repetition and, and a short update. Um, so Longship is then the first industrial uh, or at least one of the first industrial CCS projects to develop an open access infrastructure with a capacity to store significant volumes of CO2 from, from all across the European continent. Uh, in Norway, CO2 will be captured from a cement plant in Brevik and be transported by ship to Øygarn outside Bergen. Here we will see the CO2 be uploaded to a temporary uh, storage facility before it's sent by pipeline to final storage. In um, It's not really a reservoir, it's a sea line aquifer. It's, uh, it will be stored in a layer of sandstone actually, 2,600 meters below the, the sea uh, bed. Um, it's also interesting to see that Longship is already a European project. The transport and storage part is handled by Northern Lights, which is a consortium consisting of Equinor, Total and Shell. Um, the cement plant in Brevik is owned by the German Heidelberg Cement Group, and hopefully we will also receive CO2 from the waste incineration plant at Klemetsru in Oslo, where um, Finnish Fortum is one of the owners. And uh, to underline the European dimension further, uh, last week the Northern Lights received 4 million euro in EU funding for studies to expand the transport and storage capacity to over 5 million tons of CO2 per, per year, which is, uh, which is very promising. Um, to go back to these uh, four projects uh, receiving uh, funds, large funds from the EU Innovation, Innovation Fund, um, where they are all considering storage in Norway, I thought we should have just a short look at, at these and where they are located and in which sectors. So um, here in Belgium, we have a project called the, the Kairos at Sea that is based in Antwerp. Uh, partners are the companies Erlikid and BASF. And here their, their plan is to catch CO2 from production of hydrogen and chemicals. Uh, liquid CO2 will then be shipped by boat for permanent storage in the North Sea. Um, going to Sweden, we have a project called uh, Bexat Stockholm, which will create a full-scale bioenergy CCS facility and, uh, at an existing heat and, and a power biomass plant in Stockholm. Um, this project will capture and store large quantities of biogenic CO2, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is uh, also then, um, the plan is here also to, to store the, this in Norway. And, and a particularly interesting aspect of that project is that uh, we are talking about capturing CO2 from um, biological sources. And that in turn implies negative emissions, which is a path uh, where the EU is, uh, is now more and more heading, uh, and which is, uh, of course, also necessary. Um, in France, we have a project uh, at a cement factory, um, K6 project. It's located uh, in the northern part of France, west of Lille. Uh, here they will implement a range of technologies, including CCS, to re reduce emissions from, from cement production. Uh, and they are estimating that the um, factory's cement production will decrease their emissions by around 90%. Um, and this, this is also very interesting. Uh, and also one reason why uh, we are also using uh, or doing CSCS at uh, the cement factory in Brevik, because if we are able to do something uh, with emissions from cement production, that would really make a difference as cement alone accounts for around 7% of global CO2 emissions. So this is, this is a huge challenge. Um, then the last uh, project I would mention, it's located in, in Finland. It's called Shark. Uh, <laughs> that's an, abbreviation for sustainable hydrogen and recovery of carbon. So this is related to hydrogen then. It's a project at a refinery in Porvo, east of Helsinki. And here they will move from the use of grey hydrogen towards green hydrogen based on uh, uh, electrolysis and renewable energy, but also blue hydrogen, where um, uh, we see carbon capture and, and storage. So um, with a realization of these projects and hopefully also more projects coming after this, we hope to see the cost curve for CCS coming down. And, and this is 
a crucial part of Norway's uh, CCS policy as well, and, and a major reason why the Norwegian state spends a considerable amount of money on this, because we know that the first CCS products will be expensive, but also that the cost will come down for a subsequent project, um, which is what we have clearly seen in uh, wind and uh, solar, for instance, and I guess this will be discussed uh, later on during this seminar. So um, before I finish, I would also uh, like to mention that in addition to these concrete projects being developed, we see other initiatives from the European Commission, uh, both directly and indirectly supporting CCS. Um, in December, the Commission presented new legislation related to Europe's gas markets, and we see that development of a market for hydrogen is a key part here. Um, also in December, the Commission presented a communication on what they call sustainable carbon cycles, which will be followed up by legislative proposals later this year. Um, and we expect this uh, legislation to include uh, reporting and certification of carbon removals in, in uh, um, more than the energy sector, but, uh, but also in energy and in industry. And, and again, a major point for the Commission here is to develop a framework to incentivize negative emissions. And of course, then we have a number of projects listed on the EU's list of projects of common interest, uh, including the Northern Lights project. These are cross-border CCS infrastructure projects, some of them uh, already uh, receiving a considerable amount of money from, from the EU. So my conclusion is really that uh, these days it's uh, it's very interesting uh, to work on CCS in, in Europe. We are playing, uh, in my opinion, a key uh, role here. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to developments uh, moving ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Ragnar, for uh, a really interesting and dense presentation. Uh, obviously, a lot of things happening now on that uh, front and, and also for showing us the opportunities and the linkage between uh, the, the European CCS projects and the possibilities for storage uh, in, in the Norwegian part of this. Thank you so much. Um, we will then move on to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Erik Marstein. He is the head of research on solar power systems at the Institute for Energy and Technology. Eric has been researching uh, solar energy since 2003 and is passionate about industry near research. And as Eric knows better than most, the solar industry is booming and is positioned to uh, continue the growth. 2021 was a record breaker for renewables and the best year for solar installations in the EU. Today, he will give us an update on what is happening in solar in Europe and also introduce us to the solar energy value chain in Norway. Erik, welcome to the seminar. Well, thank you so much, Jatil, and thank you all for, uh, for inviting me to, to present the solar industry here. Uh, it is very good to be part of such an audience because very often we feel that when we discuss export opportunities in clean tech for Norway, there's there's a long list of things and solar energy for some reason doesn't always appear. And that to us is extremely strange, as we'll get back to. Um, um, because it's, uh, as Shetri said, we have had yet another record year. We have had basically a long chain of record years of installation uh, in, in, in the world of, of PV. Uh, I'll get back to what these numbers mean, but we are talking about annual installations uh, with a value of approximately a thousand billion NOx. And every year since 2016, if you look at new capacity of power generation, PV has been the biggest share of new generation of any technology. Uh, so, but, so it's really, really a big thing globally. Uh, and uh, just uh, to then show what uh, that means, um, uh, this is just one, one image of one of many Norwegian owned parks uh, abroad, one of Scottix parks in South Africa. Uh, here we have somewhere between three and 400,000 modules uh, on one site, a uh, huge park. Uh, and right now we are building two, three, four or five of su such parks every single day. I mean, we're installing somewhere between one and one and a half million modules every single day as we speak. I mean, that's the pace of the solar industry right now. Uh, and 2021 was a record year, uh, a tremendous jump, actually, 40 to 50 gigawatts. Uh, 
Uh, and that was in spite of COVID, that was in spite of logistics challenges, and that was in spite of a price increase caused by logistics of 10 to 20% on component level. So this is really, really happening. Uh, also in Europe, uh, we have seen growth the last years, and it's good to see that we're back to records. I mean, we had a huge crash around 2010 when all production left Europe and quite a lot of the political passion for PV for some time also left Europe. Uh, that has changed. Uh, production is coming back and installations are really, really happening. And here we see the 10 top countries in the EU uh, installing um, PV today. Uh, and it's also a bit fun uh, for Norwegian to see that Denmark and Sweden actually are on the list. Of course, substantially smaller than Germany, obviously, but uh, still moving ahead. Um, when we're then talking about uh, the global numbers, I mean, last year globally, we had 200 gigawatts. That's approximately 200 to 300 terawatt hours. So that's a couple of Norway's basically, uh, or four Denmark's uh, that happened only last year, just powered by solar power. So, so it's really, really happening. And it's very fun to see that in Europe broadly, this is happening. Also surprise markets like Poland that not all of us saw coming five years back is now really showing up. And it's fun to see companies like Equinor, for instance, investing in PV companies there. Uh, this means, of course, that there are opportunities for Norwegian industry. And one of the things that we have is an experienced solar industry. We've been doing industrial PV longer than many countries in Europe. Uh, and that competence has sometimes moved from company to company, simply because some companies around 2010-11 found the world to be a very hard place in Europe and Norway. But we do have quite a deep understanding of the, the quite radical speed and need uh, of the PV industry, and that is utilized in many companies today. Uh, first, if you start upstream, uh, almost all solar modules are made from silicon, hyper pure silicon materials. 95% uh, of the world market at least is silicon based. Uh, this is a Norwegian strong point. We have a metallurgical industry that's been making silicon for, for, for 100 years. Uh, uh, and with pioneering companies like RSE Norway, like Norsum, we are now selling what is even documented to be the greenest or most CO2 friendly silicon materials abroad. And every year that uh, part of the industry alone is contributing to reductions in CO2 of seven tons per year. Uh, it depends a bit on which markets are between three and a half and seven million tons, sorry, uh, of CO2 reduction. So it's a huge impact uh, on climate. We'll get a tiny bit back to that, but it's a sustainable industry. It's the greenest industry we have. Uh, and one of the challenges, of course, we see is that how can we make sustainability actually count? Uh, secondly, uh, we do own, uh, through REC Solar, uh, module and cell production, but that's not typically a Norwegian strength. But we see quite a lot of European capacity for making cells and modules coming up, and they are looking for raw materials. Uh, and we'll also get back to European value chains where the, the European companies who are trying to then make the greenest possible products are looking desperately to find European and green feedstock and materials and looking back to Norway. And among the project list that Ragnar mentioned uh, just briefly, there's also a huge Italian investment in a PV production site for solar modules. Uh, and there are quite a lot of initiatives along that line who will be making silicon-based materials where Norwegian companies might have uh, the material they need. And then if you look at the downstream part, uh, on the one side, we have the utility scale companies, the energy companies, uh, Scatec and Statkraft will be the two biggest ones, but we have quite a nice list here. Uh, and they are building and installing very large, and Scatec actually is one of the largest independent power producers in the field, and their growth plans towards 2025 are a bit insane, actually. Uh, we will probably hear from them a bit later at the matchmaking event, but they're heading for 25. Uh, gigawatts if I'm not counting uh, wrongly. So that's that's a tremendous drum for their five, six gigawatts today. Um, and that's, of course, in a broader portfolio where they are combining solar with wind and uh, hydro and batteries. But of course, that's what the world is doing. Also, Startcraft has a lot of competence on high PV and combines that with their other energy storage and production means to make a sustainable and robust grid. Um, then we have a very large market. I mean, at least one third of all modules are not installed in parks, but on buildings or in smaller systems. And especially in Europe, if you look at also quite a lot of the goals ahead, the building sector is going to need to innovate strongly to fulfill its energy and sustainability uh, demands. Uh, 
then it's very fun to see that especially Otovo and Solstrupspecialisten are succeeding extremely well abroad. Uh, Otovo, digital company from Norway, making uh, enabling installations in many countries. They, they are growing fast. They're, I think they're the biggest company in Sweden right now on installation. They are growing rapidly in Germany. Germany is somehow the let's say the mother of all TV, uh, more or less. Uh, and but Norway has digitalization skills, and it's possible to come in for a Norwegian company and compete heavily in that market. Also Spain, we have nice Norwegian offices and France doing a lot of installation. Uh, and then of course, we'll hear quite a lot more later on today about also the floating PV segment. Uh, this is for the Norwegian industry, a bit of a kinder egg. We combine our old PV competent with maritime sector technology. This is globally a huge field uh, uh, and uh, Norwegian companies are really trying to position themselves to, to grow into this. Right now it's dominated by other either Asian or French actually companies, but uh, we do see a lot of very interesting and innovative solutions coming out of Norway into this. And there, we have, uh, I'm heading a research center uh, and together with Solna and also the cluster uh, for the solar energy industry, we published a roadmap, unfortunately so far only in Norwegian, just highlighting some of these, uh, these things a bit further and try to paint a picture of the export potential here. But still, if you look at the exports, Within this is within renewable energy. CCS is not part of this statistics. It's from Multiconsult uh, last year. Of course, offshore wind is on everyone's lips, and it's an ex very exciting field to be in. But if we're looking at exports or uh, turnover in uh, international uh, branches of the companies, I mean, solar power is a clear second from Norway today, uh, and that was 2020, and we know that 2021 was a good year. So we are really looking forward to see last year's statistics. Uh, the problem very often for this uh, is, of course, we are not doing huge 10 billion, 50 billion projects, but we do 10,000 quite large projects. Uh, and then, of course, it's a quite different means uh, for both to support uh, people around and also for the embassies, of course, to keep track of this kind of industry, which is, of course, much more fragmented, but still there are, there are players doing good work. Uh, but there are quite a lot of initiatives happening in EU right now, uh, which uh, I, I would really urge the embassies to keep uh, an eye on. Uh, we will get a bit back to that later, uh, I, I, I trust, but there are developments aiming at giving sustainability actual value. France has a tender scheme for solar in buildings, which is working. It gives CO2 reduction a, a value in kroners, basically, or euros, which has enabled Norsen and RSC Solar to outcompete competition with a slightly more expensive product, but a much greener product, which is suddenly getting value. There are many things happening in every country, but what we are hoping for is two things. One is support from Norway should have a strategic focus on sustainability because this affects all industries. I mean, it's the same for batteries, it's for metallurgy, for anyone who wants to sell something sustainable. We want harmonized rules across Europe, which are easy and predictable. Um, and the, the way this has happened so far is that small companies in solar have spent an inordinate amount of time trying to affect how these rules look, and we should really think about how we can, as Norway, make sustainability count more, because that's going to be good for us. Secondly, uh, there is a lot of discussion on developing European value chains. Uh, there is almost no silicon production at all in Europe, apart from in one country, and that's Norway. So we can we will be a natural part in almost every European value chain when we look into solar cells. So so we really are interested to see. We really look forward to see what they will look like if they emerge. And then there are new building standards coming up. There are huge requirements on the building industry for meeting environmental requirements. Uh, and here solar is an integrated part of that very rapidly. And so that's uh, if, if we end up having the standards that EU is heading for, solar will be basically everywhere. And then also, we need at some point to look to 2030, because with the speed of solar and wind right now, we need to enable the power market to handle variable power, which means we will, we will need to give capacity also a value. I will not have time at all to go into that, but there's solar and wind are variable resources, but that can be handled. But today's market might not be ideal for handling exactly that. Big political discussion, quite a lot of food, I think, for the embassies here. Uh, and finally, there is a new EU, EU strategy for photovoltaics or for solar energy in the making as we speak. Um, it's ordered by the Commission. Uh, in, in, so there will be input to that, I think, until mid-April. So this is really something that the EU, again, 
has opened their eyes uh, for. So it's it's a very fun time to be in photovoltaics. Um, again, thank you so much for for inviting me, and thank you for your attention. Excellent, uh, Eric. Thank you so much for uh, for this presentation and also for um, mentioning how the embassies can contribute and also for uh, showing us some concrete examples of Norwegian companies having been able to compete uh, in European markets, even with maybe uh, more costly solutions, but still greener and then thereby winning uh, market shares. So thank you so much. Uh, our third speaker is uh, Ms. Eli Varum Rognerud. She is the head of Program for High Potential Opportunities, uh, which is Innovation Norway's program uh, for major export initiatives. This includes a portfolio of projects in offshore wind, hydrogen, and other renewables, as well as green maritime uh, industries and low emission transport. Eli's focus in this seminar will be on offshore wind. The European Commission has launched uh, an ambitious strategy that will increase Europe's offshore wind capacity significantly. Norwegian companies have maritime and offshore experience, but does that necessarily translate into large market shares in offshore wind? I think that is one of the questions that we will hope to hear from you, uh, Eli, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Eli, for the presentation, and thank you for the invitation this morning. Um, I, I, look, I will share with you uh, some reflections on, on how we work with this topic, and, and to sort of spoil it up front, I think the answer is no uh, advantages or competitive advantage is not automatically market shares, and I will, I will say what I mean about that. Um, just to say, uh, the HPO program and our export programs are not Innovation Norway's programs, they are joint programs. Uh, and I would like to reflect a little bit on, on the opportunities in offshore wind and how we together can work to, to further uh, industry in this um, in this domain. Um, I'm, I'm with you from France, actually, where we've just come back from Brittany. Um, I normally sit in Oslo, but uh, we've been in Brittany at an event with uh, Team Norway and uh, uh, Equinor, or Osseol, as they go by here in France. Uh, promoting Norwegian positions in the uh, French offshore wind market. So I will use that as an example of how, um, how we do this work uh, out in the field. Uh, what is important to say when we talk about export priorities and business support from uh, Team Norway, um, it's obviously a complex system, but I think what we can agree on is that it really needs to be the demand in the market and the opportunities in the market that direct our priorities and what we do. Um, that is true for offshore wind, and as we've heard um, from several other um, presenters this morning, uh, Europe has ambitions to transform their energy mix quite radically, and they are actively looking for solutions that can enable this transition. And European nations also use quite a significant amount to stimulate this market. Uh, and this is also certainly the case for offshore wind, uh, where we already see an exponential growth in the market. Um, Globally, uh, this area is expected to increase from today's 30 gigawatts of installed capacity to 300 gigawatts by 2030. That is exponential. Uh, and as you mentioned, Kjetil, the European Commission has big ambitions for offshore wind in Europe, um, growing from a current uh, 20 gigawatt to approximately 250 gigawatt by 2050. And that is a is a capex, so an annual investment of about 1,400 billion euros and an operational or an opex of about 300 billion. So, so a massive growth. Uh, and as you can see from this little illustration, Norway is tipped to lead in this domain. Um, this growth does pose, we, we, we do believe, uh, enormous opportunities for Norway. We already have significant export in this in this area, about 11 billion today, as, as my colleague Eric uh, mentioned. And we do have some uh, advantages that can help us position uh, actors in this market. As was mentioned, we already have 50 years of offshore uh, experience uh, from oil and gas, and a lot of that is valuable in the offshore wind market. We also have the privilege of having, I would say, near complete uh, value chains from developers to what we call tier one, two and three suppliers um, and complete supply chains. We, we can produce and service pretty much everything on an offshore wind farm apart from the turbine itself. Um, and we also have quite a unique first mover advantage. 
Now, Norway is operational or Norwegian actors are operational both in what is called bottom fixed and, and floating. So turbines that sit on the uh, on the seabed and the floating uh, turbines that sit on floaters anchored out at sea. Uh, but especially in floating wind, Norway was really ahead uh, of the pack, at least back in the day. Uh, Equinor, with their um, high wind uh, pilot, built the first floating offshore wind turbine already back in 2009. So a good starting point for Norway. That said, um, we are late out of the starting box when it comes to commercializing and scaling this industry and this export from Norway. And this is what really should be the wake up call for, for I think, all of us uh, around the table here. And I know many of the, the companies uh, that, that do attend. Uh, it's true that Norway just opened two areas uh, for offshore wind development in Norway in the North Sea, Southern North Sea and Utsira North. Um, and, and they will be developed and built over the next five to 10 years. But this, we need to know, is already a booming industry in globally and in Europe especially. Just as a comparison, um, the Norwegian uh, uh, licenses have been capped at four and a half gigawatt, I think it is. Here in France, they will have uh, eight gigawatt install capacity by 2028 already. Uh, in Scotland, they just announced the winners of a uh, of a competition on 25 gigawatts, and the floating component just in that Scottish um, set of tenders is 10 times what we expect to build in Norway. So this is already massive, and obviously the supply industry, developers and supply industry in these countries are are catching up. That first mover advantage, I would perhaps dare to say, is not there anymore. It is also very important to note that. Um, it's not a given to move from uh, oil and gas into, into offshore wind. Uh, we cannot assume that this transition automatically gives you a reference in the new industry, and it's certainly not the lasting one. It is a different business. A lot of the technical solutions are the same. The engineering is the same, but the contract models and the market is different. So, for example, <clears throat> whereas in oil and gas, it was very much focused on uh, tailor-made solutions and, and finding optimal solutions for a given problem, uh, the offshore wind industry is a margin business. It's, it's all about cost and it's all about standardization at present. Um, also, I should mention, let me just go one back, health and safety uh, and low environmental footprint, which also Eric uh, mentioned is uh, uh, considered a competitive advantage for Norway. It's certainly an area where we have a lot of experience. They are actually, I think we have to admit, they're cost drivers in the offshore wind industry. And at least for the time being, and I fully agree with Eric's point, at present they cannot be capitalized on. You would be surprised how remarkably few tenders actually have reduced environmental footprint carry weight in the assessment criteria in a tender. It doesn't mean that it, that it's not an advantage or, or, or a competition point, but it doesn't actually uh, give you points if you're if you're less, um, well, if you're more environmentally friendly, it doesn't give you points necessarily in the tender process. And last but not least, since our home market is far away, our suppliers must win their first offshore wind contract by and large in the markets abroad. So this is a bit like going straight to the Olympics without having competed in the nationals first. This is a very much an uphill uh, challenge for a lot of companies, especially the small and medium sized businesses in the offshore industry today. And this is where I would say Team Norway comes in and really can play a, a significant role. Now, we, we are a broad spectrum of actors that, that can support, uh, and the support starts at home. And I will just take you through a couple of um, examples of how we work and what we can do for, for Norwegian businesses wanting to enter this market. Uh, we say that export starts at home, and obviously Innovation Norway has a number of programs to help develop those innovative solutions that, uh, that will actually serve these markets. We provide significant advisory services. All our regional offices are now uh, really focusing in on, on exports and also focusing in on these uh, prioritized uh, industries that we talked about. Uh, under the auspices of the Export um, Strategy Council that some have heard of, we are together with Norweb, um, uh, also the embassies, XFIN, a number of the other actors that you see here, setting up an offshore wind entry program, getting these companies ready to compete in international markets and also helping them understand the specificities, specificities of, of the offshore wind market compared with the markets they may be coming from. Uh, we provide, obviously, internationally, uh, together with the embassies and, and other actors present, market intelligence, um, long-term networking uh, and, and stakeholder 
management, uh, I would say, uh, support with brand building, um, but also political backing and really sort of the joint strategic positioning that, that a lot of companies need. And I will give you one concrete example of this, uh, just to illustrate actually from France. Now, in France, we made, and when I say we, it's the entire team Norway, the embassy, um, Innovation in Norway, the Chamber of Commerce in Norweb, uh, and also the offshore wind cluster together. We made offshore wind a priority several years ago, and we we established a joint policy and work plan for how to how to promote Norwegian companies in this market. Uh, the embassies have used their uh, political energy dialogue proactively to further the Norwegian uh, value proposition and offering in this market, and also responded to, to demands or questions as to what themes they should raise in their dialogue with French counterparts. Uh, we helped establish a French-Norwegian industry task team where, where industry can meet with the backing of uh, official uh, representatives from both Norway and France. And obviously we provide market reports and webinars and market information as we do, uh, delegation visits, and. Also, very importantly, a very uh, professional and proactive strategic positioning or brand building, call it marketing, um, set of work and, and tools for uh, Norwegian companies, including that little film you saw spinning just now, uh, dedicated to the French um, market. I would say that this has rendered results uh, without taking any direct uh, credit for it. Uh, as I said, Equinor or Seoul are currently present here. They are in the latest round of competition for uh, a major tender on floating offshore wind in Brittany. That is the world's first fully commercial floating offshore wind tender. And fingers crossed uh, uh, that may be, may be am amongst the successful ones. Uh, and we also just had news that a, a Norwegian service and shipping company won a major uh, contract here. Um, on on the tender for an existing uh, wind farm. So we think that these have immediate results, um, or not immediate results, it's long time work, but it's, it, it is uh, a form of work and investments that have, have already proven to pay off. I should also mention that for embassies and all Team Norway members, but also businesses around the table, um, as a last word, uh, there are a number of tools for strategic positioning available uh, to use, please use them in, in furthering uh, Norwegian businesses in this field. Um, joint activity plans and, and, and uh, uh, sort of plans for how we do this uh, jointly uh, is also available. Uh, and obviously we are also happy to lend our team of experts that sit across Europe. These are just um, the offshore wind folks in Innovation Norway, but in uh, the clusters and, and Norweb also have significant presence together with the embassies out there, so do make use of them. Uh, and with that, I would like to, to, to wrap up perhaps with a um, uh, with an input or a, an encouragement to the embassies as we were as we were asked, what what can we do? What can they do? I think um, we would really encourage all of us to to prioritize and do um, put resources into these sectors where market demand match Norwegian opportunities, as Eric and uh, and Ragnar also said. Um, Use your presence and access to information and decision makers to support this industry and, and really be that captain of Team Norway and, and rally us around a, a national support for this industry. Um, it is needed. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Eli, for really giving us a much more complete picture uh, than we usually get through headlines and speeches of what are the opportunities, but also the challenges and the competition, uh, the developments uh, within uh, this uh, uh, area. Uh, and also for highlighting the example uh, that you have from Paris and from, from, uh, from France. Really interesting. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so we will move on to uh, our fourth speaker, which is uh, Christoph Pink. Uh, he is the manager for international relations at the AIDE cluster and also the newly appointed leader of the working group Hubs for Circularity. And the idea behind this uh, working group is to bring industrial and public actors from different European countries together uh, and maximizing the circularity of resources and minimizing the impacts on climate. And of course, circularity and decarbonization are, are necessary as, as ways of effectively addressing climate change, but also how do we ensure that businesses retain their competitiveness when they are uh, confronted with this, uh, these requirements of sustainability? And Christoph, thank you so much for, for joining us today. We're looking forward to hearing your uh, views on this. 
Well, thank you for inviting us. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, as you already said, my name is Christoph Pink. Uh, I work as a EU advisor for the IDA cluster in located in the south of Norway, but covering a larger geogra uh, geographical area. Uh, as we already heard, um, Norway has a theoretically a good position on, on supplying green value chains or green solutions to these renewable value chains. So the ID cluster, as I said, is, is a process industry cluster. I work for therefore for the Norwegian process industry, but also I'm I'm quite engaged in the European process industries through this buyer partnership where IDA is a member amongst several Norwegian members. Um, and just now, as already mentioned, I have taken a role on the programming committee. So uh, the dialogue between the members, the Norwegian process or the European process industries and the EU Commission. So we're sort of in the like, what, what does European Green Deal mean actually for the industry? What are the demands coming? What are the opportunities, etc.? Um, when we talk about process industries in the European context, quite often you will find that you have three big sectors, which is cement, uh, it's plastics and it's um, steel. Those are all the, the typical European process industries and the Norwegian process industries are slightly different. We are producing different types of materials. So we're more focused on what is called the non-ferrous metals or materials, which is a, a distinction that's quite often um, forgotten. It's a, it's a bit of an, we heard it already from Eric, um, that, that for example, in the silicon production, that there's a unique position basically in Europe. It's one example. So what, what does the, what does green solutions into these value chains mean? I mean, from the process industries, it, there's two, largely two aspects. One is emissions from, direct emissions from our processes, which means carbon capture. I mean, we talked about that already. There's the big pilot um, projects running now on the major emission, spot emissions in Norway. But of course, a lot of um, factories do not have that scale of emission like NORSEM. They have smaller ones, so there's a lot of activities there, piloting technologies, finding out what does it mean to capture the carbon. Um, so there's innovation projects running there. Um, the other one is, of course, um, I think we're all aware that Norway has a different energy mix, but I think it's a different uh, topic. It's very political and how to deal with that. So we're not going to blow the, the schedule here to discuss that. Um, I think we're all aware that this, this is different. Um, so that that's sort of like more or less the direct optimization of the process. But then comes the value chain focus, which is typical for the process industries. So what what do I mean by that? Um, we already heard that yes, renewable energy is important for the green transition. Um, electric mobility, for example, is is recognized as an important point. But it's not about producing batteries. It's about producing the greenest batteries or the lowest footprint batteries. It's about not necessarily about producing windmills, but is actually producing them with the lowest environmental footprint. Um, the same goes for, for solar panels. I mean, that's what sustainability is about, and that's what the European Green Deal is about. It's not just about changing the way we do things, but it's also lowering the footprint of, of the, the processes behind the curtain. So in order to do that, um, one of the main focus areas of the cluster is the circular economy, of course. Um, in, in the material fields that we produce, it's a, it's a key requirement or it's a key strategy to lower the footprint of the, uh, of the products that we all consume or the infrastructures we build. But as we are also heard already that it, this doesn't translate automatic into a, into a business opportunity or the opportunities in green, basically, they, are we still ahead of the, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying we're ahead of the curve, but I think um, we see that, as already mentioned, for example, in tendering processes, um, it's not necessarily the case that producing the greenest or the, the, the best solution, let's put it in a sustainability perspective, um, gets the deal. We are not there, unfortunately, but we, I think we're making, we're moving in that direction. Uh, I have two practical examples um, on that. One is um, a company from, from our cluster, they produce fiberglass. 
and they produce actually the fiberglass with the lowest footprint in Europe or probably worldwide. Um, and they're a major exporter and they produce mainly for the for the wind industry. And you would think our wind industry, renewable energy, there's a sustainability focus that should count. No, they actually have a more uh, a pricier process. Or slightly pricier, a lot greener, but the slightly pricier is playing against them. So it's not something that automatically counts. And that's something we, we have to address, I think. Um, the other example is uh, already like solar was mentioned and the activity in France. And of course, they pro I mean, not of course, but they produce the greenest or the lowest footprint uh, solar cells worldwide. Um, and they're starting to make that count. There's some uh, initiatives, regulation, framework conditions that Eric mentioned that are really sort of give it, starts giving them an edge in some markets. And I think that's quite important to know or understand that the market dynamics um, are lagging a little bit behind uh, what is possible to offer, basically. So um, the it's about the rule. How do we how do we make the footprint count? Um, do we the rules of the game are they actually working for that or are they not? Um, that's something that we have to be quite aware of. Of course, the um, taxonomy rules are coming. Some have already come. Others are coming and they will evolve over the next years again. Um, and they will probably change the landscape. Uh, I expect that at least. I've been working in sustainability now for 20 years and it's it's it was about time something like this happened, to be honest. Uh, we have to understand it, um, but it is actually a tool to reshape uh, the market dynamics. And I think um, we should all be glad for that. Um, so, yeah, that's I would I would just say that. Um, if you want the green solutions, I think Norway is a very good partner. We have high competences in the industries. Uh, we can develop, co-develop with other international partners. I mean, that's what we do inspire. Um, so I think if we manage to make that count, and that would be my sort of uh, my little prayer for today. If we can make the green count in in the procurement processes or tendering processes or in general on the market, I think we're moving a big step ahead, both on the green transition in general. We're meeting the requirements of the European Green Deal um, and we're creating actually an, I would say, a, a deserved opportunity and a deserved competitive advantage for the European, uh, for the Norwegian process industries. Um, we, it's it's been said many times already today, so just bear that in mind. I think that would be from my side um, the key point. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Christoph, and uh, and really for bringing up uh, uh, or underlining the the need for uh, for real green solutions. And I think in in the way the embassies work and how they talk about. Norwegian contributions and solutions in the European Green Deal. I think this is a very useful input and and it also probably makes some embassies think that we should think about how we communicate through uh, about these uh, these uh, solutions. So that's very helpful. We now have a few minutes for questions. If there are anyone out there who would like to uh, ask a question, please use this opportunity now to raise your hand um and uh i will see if we can uh, be able to pick them up and if you are uh, hesitant to take the floor uh please uh, do so but in in the meantime i can uh, start off and then you can uh, uh, raise your hand as we go along Ragnar, can i start with you um you presented a picture where uh, certainly, there is a great development when it comes to CCS. CCS is being increasingly acknowledged in many areas as one of the solutions that we need to reach the goals. Yet, there is a quite a, a large degree of skepticism towards CCS in, uh, in some countries. Can you uh, explain a little bit about what, where does that come from? Yeah, um, thank you for, for the question. Uh, this is indeed a relevant point. Um, 
uh, even though there is a, a lot of reasons for uh, being optimistic, there is still work to be done. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we also in Brussels see uh, still skepticism um, towards CCS as, uh, and, and there might be different uh, reasons for this. We also see this in some, some countries, uh, for instance, in, in Germany, where we have seen skepticism related to, is this really safe? Will it work? Uh, and we still meet from time to time uh, the argument that this is uh, just another excuse for continuing uh, oil and gas business as before. Uh, but in this context, I think it's uh, it's very clear that if uh, Europe is to succeed reaching the climate targets, there is uh, not much alternative. If we are to reduce emissions from some of these industries, we don't have much choice. We need CCS as this one of these uh, important tools in the toolbox. And I think that a lot of actors uh, will realize this for themselves. So what it's important to do from our side, I believe, is to uh, simply uh, describe what are we doing in Norway? Why are we doing it? And why are we uh, certain that this actually uh, actually works? And we have a lot of uh, good uh, competence on this. We have a lot of materials uh, which can be be helpful in this respect. So if any of the embassies would need uh, some information or whatever, uh, don't hesitate to, to get in touch. Thank you, uh, Ragnar. Uh, Erik, um, you talked, of course, about the uh, the ever pace of record years when it comes to, to solar. Um, but how important is solar in Norway? And is there something about the... What about the reference projects in Norway? Is that, uh, is that a challenge to Norwegian companies when going abroad that they have... How how do you compare this the uh, the uh, development of solar in other European countries compared to Norway and how that influences on the Norwegian companies? Well, uh, I think I mean there's a lot of assumptions and myths and theories about the need of home markets. Of course, a home market in many cases is important, but it's definitely not important in all cases because what we bring to the table is different things. I mean. Um, to, the reason, or the, the two reasons why solar is actually so attractive nowadays is partly because it's cheap and partly because it's really easy. Uh, so, so just to get that installed, to get your first gigawatt up and going, is you basically you, you have the blueprint for how to build that. It's it's not a very hard technology. The challenges that arise as a function of the growth of solar and wind, for that matter, land-based or or wind-based, is that. At some point, variable power needs to be handled. Uh, and that means that our competence on digitalization, and Norway is a very digital country, uh, is extremely crucial because that's what we are actually doing. We're trying to make systems that are able to handle, control, and, and make sure that we have energy whenever needed by combining solar, wind, batteries, uh, demand side management, um, what have you. So the digital space is maybe a more important background uh, for actually exporting solar than to be able to install solar because the, the, the reason it works is because every electrician in your neighborhood can do so. Uh, and secondly, uh, a lot of the bigger tenders, I mean, there are, again, Scottic will probably come later, but I mean, one of the cool things with the Norwegian companies uh, and the Norwegian scene is that the embassies and Norway have a tremendously good reputation when it comes to energy and transparency. If you want to build big projects, and that are truly green uh, and and you want to know where the funds go and how the finances are set up and you want transparency and you want a reliable partner norwegian companies are not the worst you can select uh, and we are, we are looking at billion dollar investments in, in some of the biggest utility scale parks uh, and uh, then the norwegian companies supported by embassy supported by innovation or we supported by grom crew is is, is a very good team in general. So, so I think that's that's very important. And that's one of my hopes. I think that, I mean, Team Norway for clean tech in general will be that. I mean, that Norway is going to be recognized as a green country supporting the green transition and supplying the right sustainable solutions in a transparent manner. Uh, and then we can combine, I mean, we have an oil sector to replace at some point. Solar will obviously not do that alone. But wind will not do that alone either. But if you add hydrogen batteries and everything else to the mix, the totality of turnover and people is going to be very, very big. 
Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Eric. I think we we will take our uh, the time for one question. I think Lars Andersen from the embassy in Copenhagen. Are you with us? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, and uh, thank you for all the uh, uh, very interesting uh, presentations. I, my question is actually, I, primarily, I guess, to Ragnar, uh, on the more sort of political um, side of this. Uh, we do know that uh, Norway's uh, attachment to the internal market is is uh, through the EA agreements, and that represents certain challenges uh, sometimes when it comes to uh, the fact that we're not inside a room when technical standards are being set and and uh, when agreements are drafted with third countries, etc. We saw we saw a, a, an example of of that impact uh, as a you know the, the consequence for of of uh, for our battery industry in respect to uh, the um, EU-UK uh, agreement. Uh, is there, uh, what what sort of processes are in the move now, now that we should be uh, very much aware of and try to influence? Uh, I mean, I know, for instance, there has been a discussion on the so-called taxonomy uh, and, the, and the question surrounding uh, whether uh gas would be seen as part of a, a sort of the tr and transitional form of energy uh there is some discussion about blue hydrogen etc um so i would i would appreciate if if the if i could say a little bit more about that side of of uh of the green transition and uh and uh is there anything that we uh who are uh posted to the uh, member states should um should race uh, with our uh, host countries. Yeah, thank you very much for for the that question, uh, which is indeed an extremely uh, relevant one. Um, I mean, uh, it's and it's it's a huge one as well. I mean, we we have the EA agreement. Uh, we um, in place. We are cooperating with the EU on on a lot of uh, issues. In addition to that. Uh, the framework is as it is, uh, and for us working at the delegation in Brussels, I mean, we we need to do the most uh, of it um, within within these uh, frames. Um, it, but I would say that we 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 uh, we do have uh, a good reputation in Brussels and and elsewhere also, I believe, uh, on the end this uh, side because we are uh, seen as. Uh, uh, reliable uh, and serious partner uh, so so what we bring to the table will be listened to at least that's that's my impression if it's of relevance and if it comes at the right time and this is the challenge eh? because there are a lot of processes and a lot of discussions going on in Brussels all the time uh, I guess we could have been uh, uh, I mean we uh, so, so we need we need to um, work together uh, I mean the the team Norway way of thinking. I think it, that that is useful. I mean we have uh, we have uh, people at the Norwegian delegation, but we also have Norwegian companies uh, in Brussels. We have Norwegian organizations in Brussels. They are connected to their um, organizations uh, again, their uh, uh, sister companies, etc. And in some, I think we have a, a quite good uh, overview of what is going on, but uh, it's also a matter of prioritizing. So when it comes to taxonomy, for instance, we did a lot of work on that, particularly on hydropower, really, because that uh, was um, uh, the concern for hydropower uh, and the role of hydropower in taxonomy. That was that was really a concern not many of the member states raised so if someone uh, should do it it had to be us so th this is so, so my point is really that we need to be very clear and focused as we got which uh, topics we are engaging uh, in and then we should use a lot of resources to get that through because we are not able to to uh, uh, involve uh, deeply in all these uh, process this is going on to be a bit more concrete i would say that for instance where we have norwegian uh, competence uh, as we have in a lot of these uh, areas we have been discussing today, this competence, the technical competence to know how how does this work, uh, this is extremely important. The information also to the to the commission. Uh, so 
uh, on, on carbon capture and storage, for instance. I mean, how many people are working in DJ Energy on CCS? How many are really have that knowledge? It's not that huge a number. <laughs> it's, it's not many at all. So for us to be actually engaging with them uh, in their discussion, uh, trying to uh, share Norwegian experiences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think this is this is the, this is key. And some of these rules coming up at the moment. I mean, taxonomy. It's a lot of fuss about that. I'm not sure if we're able to really. Uh, I mean, now it's been decided. Huh? So so now the, it's uh, uh, unless Parliament or Council actually vetoes it, that discussion is over. Uh, but where we can influence is, for instance, what I mentioned: new rules for the gas market, hydrogen market get coming up extremely important to us. This is now in process. This is an area where we should engage. Um, these proposals related to uh, sustainable carbon cycles, how to incentivize negative emissions, would, which would indeed be uh, relevant to the carbon capture uh, project at Clemetry in Oslo. This is ex ex on these areas, I think we could uh, be useful for the Commission and then we would be able to get our message through. Thank you again, uh, Ragnar. Uh, I have uh, many more questions on my list, but uh, in the interest of time, I see that we, we need to wrap up. So it, this is the end of uh, today's uh, seminar. In the next seminar, next week, we will look into green shipping, hydrogen and batteries. Uh, invitations will be sent out either later today or tomorrow. But the registration is already open and I think that there will be a link in the chat for that if you would like to already now register. And with this I would like to thank the, uh, the speakers Ragnar, Erik, Eli and Christoph and also the moderators from Innovation Norway, Ole Jørgen, Gyrid and Rita and of course every one of you who participated and looking forward to seeing you again next week. Goodbye.